Stephen. Thank you, Sharon, so much. And good morning, everyone. Can you think of a better way to start a Saturday morning than to listen to a world champion speaker? Well, that's the opportunity we have today. Mike Carr has made a lot of mistakes in his communication, so you don't have to. For 25 years, Mike tried, failed, learned, and tried again to become a better communicator until he learned well enough to become the 2020 world champion of public speaking and speak to groups large and small around the world about leadership, business alignment, and effective communication. Come on in, sit down, and let's have a conversation about how communication is changing and how we can be more effective using it. Mike Carr joined Toastmasters 25 years ago to help his speaking stay on track, stay on time, and eliminate filler words. At that time, he had one wife, one kid, and very few stories. 25 <laughs> years later, Mike cannot count the ways Toastmasters has helped his presentations in life and work. Today, he still has one wife, but now has eight kids, many stories, and many more life lessons. He is a member of Austin Toastmasters and Laughing Matters Toastmasters in Austin, Texas in the United States and has been blessed to represent his clubs in a contest or two. When not being a dad, Mike is a partner in a financial planning firm and speaks frequently to groups on the subjects of leadership, business alignment, and effective communication. Please give a District 63 welcome to the 2020 world champion of public speaking, Mike Carr. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me into District 63, all of the wonderful places in Tennessee. Now, we, we were talking before we all got together that I'm a big soccer head and my soccer team is going to go visit the Na that Nashville soccer team. So hopefully I get to be physically in your in your part of the world here, here very, very soon. So I hope today we, we can have a, a bit of a conversation about effective communication, some of the, the things that I have learned through some very painful lessons that maybe you can take and you can change your part of the world, whether it's in a speech contest or a business meeting or with your grandkids, with your family or your church or organization. Hope this, hope this helps and I hope we stay in touch. And if I don't answer those questions, feel free to email me and I would love to try to do that. But first, I'd like to tell you a story. This story begins with me standing on stage saying these words. I got into the car and she took off. That's the way I started my semifinal in 2015 at the International Speech Contest. I was the 10th speaker and I used that to try to grab the judge's mind so that maybe I might stay in their mind at the end. I told this story about how I had messed up a gift to my wife. She had really telegraphed. She wanted this ring and I waited till the last minute. I messed it up. I was insensitive and ultimately it was a story where I had to ask her forgiveness, but she gave it to me. People cried in the audience. They laughed. I sat down on the front row at that speech contest and the, the results started coming. They named third place and it wasn't me. <laughs> they named second place and it wasn't me. And I thought, oh my goodness, I am going to the finals. I am so, I was the 10th speaker. That was probably, I felt great about that speech. They named first place and it wasn't me. I didn't even place. I had placed second at the semifinals in 2013. The person I lost to went on to play second in the finals. And now I didn't even place. And so many well-meaning people, so many well-meaning people, if you've been in a contest and you have not placed or you didn't win, you know how this feels. So many well-meaning people came up and said, oh, 
you were first on my ballot. Oh, I thought you were the best. And, and they were so nice to say that. And it felt like, oh, 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 you know, I just thought, oh, oh, because the contest is subjective, isn't it? You know, one person thinks that speech A is the greatest speech they have ever heard. And the same speech can be heard by another judge and feel like, oh, I just didn't like that speech. It's so subjective. I went back home and I thought, what do I do with this? My mind drifted back to a time whenever in a professional, in a business setting, I was sitting in New York City around, around 2009 I was sitting around a lot of fellow managers. I was managing a, a global, I was managing part of a global financial firm at the time. We had just come out of the Great Recession. We had kicked and scratched just to be able to help our, our company survive through all of that. And I sat around this group of managers and I, I looked at them. Every single one of them just was in misery because we had all worked so hard just to help our company survive. But now we were coming into this meeting where we had put on us these huge, big, massive goals. And what our CEO down told us, if you can't make these goals happen, there are a lot of good managers out on the street, we'll find someone who will. So all of us knew we were going to get fired. We were gonna work 15 hours a day for the next year and we would miss the goal and we'd be fired. Everybody, everybody around the table had their resumes out, ready to go to other positions. Everybody, except me. Because I had just moved my family for the third time in, in three years. We were in Austin and we, I, I knew that if we moved again, took another job, that it would not be great on a couple of my kids. Very candidly, it would not be great on my marriage. There's a possibility that I might make that move alone. And so it was not an option for me to have my resume out, to be looking for another position but I knew I couldn't hit those big goals. I, I wandered, I staggered kind of back to the hotel room. And I went in and I looked at myself in the mirror in the bathroom. And I just looked at myself standing there and I, I, said, I, I, I said audibly to myself, how did you get to this place? There's a book that was written by an author named Daniel Kahneman called Thinking Fast and Slow. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for decision theory. He, he wrote about the way people think. And one of the things he says in that book is that when we get stressed, when we have so much reaching in on us and we feel that stress, and has anyone in the audience ever felt stress? <laughs> If you're not raising your hand, then I, I have to wonder if, if you're actually human. <laughs> I have to wonder if maybe you're from the future or you're one of those cyborgs from Star Trek. <laughs> that when people get stressed, then what happens is all of the blood races away from the newer, more creative parts of our brain, and it, it races to the oldest the, the central part of our brain, some call it the lizard brain, some call it the lizard brain. It is the oldest part of our brain. Scientists call it our amygdala. The amygdala is the thing that is constantly looking around for what could hurt us, what we fear. It is when our ancestors were on the savannah or in the moors or coming over the hill that was constantly looking for the lion or the bear or the enemy coming from around the rock. And that's what kept our ancestors alive. And so the amygdala is, is highly 
built up in our brains to keep us from fear. So as a survival instinct, when we get stressed, the blood races away from our creativity just for survival. But what Kahneman found in his studies was if we can release that fear, if we can realize that our lives are not threatened and settle back, then the blood flows back to the creative, the newer parts of our brain. And all of a sudden we began to think of solutions that solve our problems. So as I was, was standing looking at myself in New York City in that mirror, knowing that I didn't have my resume out because I couldn't move because that wasn't best for my family. I looked at myself and right after I asked, how did I get to this place? I said to myself the two words that came to make all the difference. And sorry, it's three words. <laughs> I, I was so stressed, I had a hard time counting. <laughs> it was three words that came to make all the difference. I looked at myself in the mirror and I said, I give up. I give up. Now that's anathema in Western culture, isn't it? We don't give up. We give speeches about the, the wartime heroes standing in front of audiences, and we call out Churchill, who gave the speech that said, never, 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 never give up. We don't give up, do we? But sometimes, sometimes, that's the very best thing we can do. Because what happened in that business setting after I gave up, all of a sudden, the big goals that were pressing down on me from the company, I wasn't concerned with that anymore. I became very focused on doing the few things that I could control that I could focus on every day. And so we went back to our office and we gathered our team and we said, why did you get into this business in the first place? And people said, well, we got into this business to, to help people retire with dignity and to help take care, educate their children and, and take care of their parents. And, they, and so we said, okay, let's, we, can, we, can't, we can't control the big goals, how big those goals are, whether we can hit them, but we can pick up the phone and go take a client to lunch and ask them how fearful they are with these markets dropping. We can go and do our research. We can, what are, and so we focused five things that we could control every day. And then we just tried to get one-tenth of 1% 1 better on each of those five things every day. And a crazy thing happened. At the end of 18 months, we were the number one firm in the entire financial, financial uh, that, that financial company system. And we had far surpassed the goal that was out there. And we were shocked because we'd given up on the big goal. But giving up on the big goal is what caused us to beat it. And so in 2015, whenever I took no trophy home from the Toastmasters semifinals, I remembered what happened with our financial firm. And I thought, okay, I'm going to give up on trying to win a trophy. All I want to do is take a message and hopefully maybe see if it will change just one life in each audience. That's it, just one. When I started thinking about that, I thought about the young woman from Japan who came up to me after that semifinal. And she did say, you were number one on my ballot, but she went on to say, I am so glad you shared 
that story. You were transparent about that difficulty between you and your wife because I've been having difficulty with my husband. And what I'm saying is what I need to do is I need to ask his forgiveness and I need to forgive him. And I've never talked with her again, but I've, I've held on that one conversation that maybe in that failure of a speech, it was not a failure at all. It was meant for her, not for those judges, not for the finals of the World Championship of Public Speaking, that it accomplished its purpose in this world. And I thought, okay, I give up on the trophy. I will never win the World Championship of Public Speaking. I may never win another semifinal. I just hope to have a speech that I can change a life with. And that's what I'm going to look for. So the next year we were traveling back from a vacation. My wife gets car sick and so she has to drive everywhere. I laugh and I tell her that it's, it's not that she really gets car sick, it's that she's a control freak and so she wants to be in control. <laughs> and, and she um, looks at me, she gives me the side eye. Have you all ever had the side eye? You know, that's when she, someone's driving and you say something that is uh, provocative and they kind of, you know, I get the side eye and, and I have to laugh because I know she actually does get car sick. I have seen her very car sick before and she is benevolent to let me tease her about it. But she was driving. We were coming back from vacation. And so I get to, as I'm riding along, read, I can write, I can do a lot of things in the car. I don't get car sick at all. And I was reading this book by Mark Manson. It talked about trying to release things in our lives. And in that book, he told a story about losing a friend in a drowning. He was, when he was a teenager, his best friend lost, and, and that, and that, 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 that happening, that, that event changed him at a very core level. All of a sudden, I just kind of leaned back and I thought, wow, that's such an impactful story. I, I wonder if I have a version of that myself. And all of these memories came flooding back about a friend of mine named Maria who I lost whenever I was about 16, 17. It just flowed back. So I'll talk a little bit more about Maria here in a second, but I wanna pause here and I wanna, I wanna talk about you because this is one of those principles as we go through and I promised I would talk about my journey to this world championship of public speaking, but a lot of it has to do with you and where you live today. And I, I would encourage you to steal some things if they're, if they're useful to you and only you will know if they really serve you and if it's for you. But here's one thing that I get a question. I get asked a lot. A lot of people will ask me, wow, Mike, I, I've been in the contest a number of years. I feel like I've told all my best stories. Where do you get your stories from? And, and one, of, one of the big areas is I try to read a lot. I read a lot of, of nonfiction. Now I will try to read some more fiction than I used to, but I'm, I'm reading a lot of nonfiction. And when I run across a great story that I feel impacts me in my body, and when I read Mark's story about losing his friend, I felt what that did to me right right in my chest and how I felt kind of along the the back of my my head when I feel that now I've begun to another part of the brain our reticular activator that if we ask ourselves a lot it's kind of like when you buy a red car you see red cars everywhere if I if we ask ourselves and particularly if we ask ourselves out loud what are great stories around me our brains are, the way the creator made our brain, it's just, our brains are amazing puzzle, puzzle developers. They look for puzzle pieces everywhere and then, and then build that puzzle when we're sleeping, when we're in the shower. You know, that's why we always want to have a, a recording device close because you're in the shower and you go, oh my goodness, I just thought of the best speech. How do I? Then you get out of the shower, dry off and Wait, 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 wait. Oh no, I've lost it. You know, it's, it's, it's in those times of repose that 
the brain goes and create and pulls all those disparate puzzle pieces together to create that puzzle. And all we have to do, it's really very simple. If we out loud just ask ourselves questions, our brain begins to look for the answers. And so I was asking myself about this and asking myself, what stories am I hearing that impact me? And then when, when you begin to hear those stories, if you will just ask yourself, wow, why did that impact me? How was that story conveyed that created an impact on me? And most importantly, what is my version of that story? Because stories that impact us the most have kernels, cores of universal truth. The reason Mark's story impacted me was because most people, if we've lived any life at all, we've lost someone. Even, a, chi even a, a child that's relatively young may maybe has lost a grandparent. At this point, a lot of us have lost parents or friends or others. And so there is embedded in a story that impacts us. If we think long enough about it, there is our version of that story. And so as I, I heard, as I read Mark's story and I, and I asked myself, what's my version of that? All of a sudden, all of these memories about Maria came pouring back on me. And so we're driving along the, the roads of West Texas. And if you know those roads at all, they are not like the roads of Chattanooga, Tennessee. They're not beautiful, tree-lined, winding, gorgeous. They, in West Texas, they are brown and straight and boring. And the, the most interesting thing to look at are longhorns. And once you've seen one, You've seen everyone. So my mind was able to drift along and think, okay, what were the characteristics of Maria? Maria was joyful. Maria died at a young age, but every time, do I remember any time we were with her that she wasn't lighting up the room? Why was she like that? One thing that was, that was interesting about her was that when I first thought about it, I thought, oh, there's no way to work that into the story is that she was very, she was blonde, very pale, but she had a heart condition that made her very pale skin a bluish color. Oh, she was blue. Yeah, I always thought that was so, so cool about her. But the thing that I really thought I knew was neat was that she was so effervescent. She was vibrant in her life. But there was something about the blue nature that was that was interesting. And here's another principle that I would suggest that you might want to steal is that I had a sales years ago, a, a sales trainer tell me differences sell, similarities don't. Differences sell, similarities don't. So as I thought, well, if I'm trying to change just one life, in a contest, essentially, aren't I trying to sell that person on this idea, sell that person on the idea of maybe making a change that would make his life better or her life better? So maybe the fact that Maria was blue, that's something I've, I think that heart condition has been solved now. I, I, don't, I don't run into folks anymore that have stenosis, that have a bluish color to their skin. That could be unique. That would be interesting. Hmm. Okay, well, so what else is blue then? Well, the sky is blue. Lakes are blue. Feelings are blue. If I'm sad, I feel blue. I started, I, I pulled out my journal and I started, I started writing down, just brainstorming on what's blue? What does blue mean? What's in blue? If I use blue as I break it up as an acronym, what is it? Blue, best love, 
over everyone. Why well, that doesn't even make, and that doesn't even spell blue. <laughs> I'm, I just, I, I put everything, brainstorm down, and little by little, there were pieces of that speech. And if, if you don't know what I'm talking about, my semifinal speech this last year, the speech that I gave from the club all the way through semifinals was a speech called Blue. And it, it talked about my friend Maria and the lesson that I learned from her that I came to realize that she knew she was going to live a short life. And the way she decided to respond to that was to bring joy and light and laughter to every single moment with her friends every day. And just the suggestion that we have someone like that in our lives that we can think and that we could be more like that in our lives. So as I was driving back, I, I had all of a sudden, all this kind of came together. We pulled up in the driveway. I went immediately into actually this room right here. I pulled up my computer and I just started typing. And I, I, it was for the next probably hour. It just all poured out onto the screen. It was way too long. It was probably a 14 minute, 15 minute speech. And I had to, I knew that I, I speak at about 114 words a minute with pauses because I love pauses. <laughs> and I had to shrink it down. So started cutting that way. There were things I added, there were things I took away. So I, I got it down to about a 10 minute speech and I signed up for my next club meeting. I went in, we have a, a big club at Austin Toastmasters. There were probably about 40 people in the room that night. There were some good friends that hadn't been there for a while. And I, I got up, they introduced me. I got up and I, I, I started with, she was blue. And we went forward. I just told the story about Maria and what I had remembered. It was a different speech than the one that you may have heard in the semifinal, but not too dissimilar. I didn't really look at everyone. There were some individuals that I looked at as I went. And I finished the speech. Everyone politely clapped. We finished the meeting, but then people started coming up to me in tears saying that that spoke to me. I want to do something different because of that. And that was the motivating factor that caused me to want to give that speech again and make it better. And nothing, my friends, nothing makes a speech better than the contest. And this is what I would step in and say to those of you, if you're not Toastmasters, if you've just dialed in thinking, what is this thing? <laughs> Let me just tell you, I do a lot more speaking professionally over this last year. And I mastermind, I talk with a lot of professional speakers and there is no better opportunity for us right now to practice using this format going forward. The world is opening back up, but we have hybrid meetings. They're here forever. This is the way we're going to be talking with our grandkids and the way we're going to be talking with friends as we become more mobile around the world. What I'm hearing from the professional speaking ranks is, oh, we're going to have in-person meetings. It's just they're going to be once a year, the big meetings, but we, we need to do more training. And this is how training is going to happen. I cannot understand why the entire world are not members of Toastmasters right now because the, we, it's like when the telephone was first invented and there was a group that said, hey, we're practicing telephone etiquette every week. Come and, and we're a whole lot of fun. Come and join us. I mean, <laughs> telephone changed the world. This, this is going to happen. If you don't believe me, listen to Seth Godin. Seth Godin has been right about trends for the last 20 years, and he's saying Zoom is going to change the world. If you don't believe him, listen to Gary Vaynerchuk. Now, Gary Vaynerchuk cusses every sentence, so you know if you don't like that, ignore that. But Vaynerchuk has been 
I think it's Vaynerchuk is how he pronounces it, but he has been eerily accurate. So if you're not, if you're not in Toastmasters, let me just tell you, my friend, jump, jump on in. The water's fine. We'll love you. You want to fail here and not in front of the board of directors. And that's the thing that I tell my professional speaking friends who are no longer members of Toastmasters is why would you test new material on a audience that's paying you? Test it at Toastmasters. And so that's what I did in the contest. I started giving that speech blue. And as you know, if you've had any contest, as it moved forward, I got greater and greater feedback. I won the division and I called up Mark Brown. And I told Mark, Mark, last time I went to the semifinals, I didn't even place. And I think it's because I just didn't have a sense of an international audience. I have a very domestic focus. I know, I know what wins a contest and moves forward in Central Texas. I'm not sure I know what a Japanese judge or a Sri Lankan judge votes for. And Mark helped me change that blue speech into something that was more sensitive to international ears. And it won. But the reason it won is because I had given up on it winning. I just wanted it to change the life. And so when I went to the finals and I finally won, it was, no one was more shocked than I was. I was standing in my bathroom, just kind of getting ready. And I happened to glance down at the results on my phone and my family heard me say out in the living room, oh crap. <laughs> and they came running in just like, what? And I said, I won. But there was a wonderful Toastmaster that reached out to me and said, I want you to know that that blue speech changed my life. And here's how. And I promise you that was every bit as sweet as any trophy that I carried away. If you will reach out and try to change the world for just one person, in your speaking. Your speaking will be better, it will be more impactful, and it will, it will last, it will, it will stay with you longer. It will be sweeter than any trophy you ever take forward. When you release wanting to win, then the creative centers of your brain fire up and they bring you solutions, ideas that you never would have come to if you were just so tense after something. So some people, it really works for them to go, go, go for that trophy. But for the rest of us, I hope that this is helpful and I hope it causes you to reach out and, and change the world. Thank you so much for inviting me letting me be with you. I hope that's been, hope that has served you. Hope we can stay in touch. And I look forward to hugging you at an international convention in person coming up soon.